Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. I am Michalik, and today, with the recent release of Patch 8, giving us the Bard and the Gnome, and a bit of an update with the character creation process, I have decided that we are going to be doing another character creation mega video. The two that I did in the past, one of them prior to early access, and then the actual one at the beginning of early access, those seem to go over pretty well within the community. A lot of y'all seem to really like it. And I figured since patch eight is giving us an overhaul with the hair system for our character selection, I thought, you know what? A lot has changed in these past eight patches. So let's just see what's new compared to how it was at the very beginning. Who are you? I am ready for adventure. That's who I am. Okay, so I know a lot of y'all are probably going to be a little impatient about it. So I'm going to give y'all what you want. We are going to jump straight into the appearance tab. And we're going to start with the one thing that I know everyone is going to love. The new hair system. Now, overall, it was talked about that now across all genders and all races, all hairstyles are now available. In addition to us having hair highlights, hair graying. Those two options, I fiddled with them a little bit um, yesterday. There's a lot to customize there. And just for the sake of not having a big old weapon in our way, let's change our class real quick. Bard, no, cleric, that's a stick. Druid, that's a stick. Fighter, that's another stick. Ranger, that's another stick. R what? Why does everyone have a stick? That's another stick. You don't have a stick. There we go. You have that. That works. All right. Pretty elven face. They really did do a good job of overhauling the face in the past two patches. But that's not why you're here right now. I mean, in a way it is, but it also is not because we are here for hair. We're starting off with hair. All right. So in general, they now have these marked as numbers and letters 2A, 3A, etc so that things are differentiated between the genders. It really does look pretty good. This is oddly my favorite so far. Oops. <laughs> okay, let me just jump right into this then. So hair colors obviously are all still here, but the beauty of the new changes is we have highlights. Highlight intensity. If you if you don't want to bother with highlights, just drag this whole slider down and you get your old selections. You can do whatever you want with it. But for customization purposes, slide the intensity up, get one color and get the other. Maybe I should find some actual deep colors. There we go. That looks nice. All highlight colors. There we go. And y'all can just play with this for as long as your hearts desire. Now let's take a look at the gray next. Let me find something that I like real quick. There was a, a random one that I grabbed that worked. Here it is. I like this color combo. I wasn't intending to grab this color combo, but I like it. I really do. For graying intensity. Ooh. That's uh it's a lot of gray. We have different tones. Uh, I wonder if they're gonna be adding more just based on this button right here. Let me make you higher. I'm not seeing too, too much of a difference here. Hmm. 
I guess if you spend enough time here, you will see a difference and you will find the exact color that you like. Actually, for your curiosity's sake, before I move on, um, let's make not ash blonde. What is it? So there's already gray hair. I'm going to remove that highlight real quick. So we're going to have not aqua. Ash blonde, ash blonde, no, no. Gray, gray, gray. Okay, so let's do a darker gray. Then come back, bring back intensity with a lighter gray, and then add actual graying intensity. This is, that, that turned out really good. Hmm. That's a grandma with good hair. <laughs> I guess you got to be smart about certain color combinations. This is really nice. Green tones. Okay, so this is, for the most part, all we got for the color changing options that are added to the game. But like I said, there are a lot of options here to choose from. And like most of us, when we are in this little tab messing with our appearance, we are going to be here for quite a while. So I always suggest you should get comfy when you are making a new character. Now, for the sake of moving on, let me get some drastic hair color differences. Get the graying back down. Make that. Let's just stick with this right now. It's not too drastic, but there is a good contrast there. Maybe a little bit high. No, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right there. That's, that's good. That's good. All right now, one thing I did kind of want to specify that I noticed is that each of these hairstyles, their highlights are separated differently. Every hairstyle has a different highlight pattern. And we are going to cycle through them and see what we can find. And I know there's a lot. So we're going to be here for a hot minute. For a, now, this is my usual hairstyle for most of my characters. Ooh, this looks really, that's a really good contrast with this set, with this hair set. You know, I really am glad the naysayers have pretty much died out um, for this game because uh, literally it's all just it's all been going up. It's all it's all just consistently getting better and better and better. That looks really good. I remember from the live stream, I briefly talked about this in my recap. They had specifically talked about the afro hairstyle and that with that as an example they made a lot of their hairs better more fluffy less flat more alive and i don't i don't think they did that kind of tweaking to all the hairstyles because i don't think all of them needed it but just from what i've seen so far i think it's safe to say they did they did a good bit of work when they say overhaul, they I think they truly did overhaul it. Ah, oh, this hairstyle is really cute. Oh no. I blame the colors. The colors are making me love this hairstyle. And if any of you are still wondering, I do still plan on making a video devoted to the Bard. Life's been getting away from me, but I've been, I've been watching the community. I've been paying attention to the updates. I am not forgotten. I am still here. Oh yeah, and the music got updated. I might be wrong. This may have been added a patch or two back, but just 
Hearing the by the river, river. I, I don't remember that. I really do not remember that. And I do really need to make a new list of music in game for more ambiences that I haven't touched yet. Because I do know some of those got tweaked. Some of them not by much, some of them by a good bit. I'll have to go and hunt them down again and figure out which ones are nice to record and listen to. And Kaga's hair actually be looking pretty good when it has color. Because originally on Kaga, I did not like it, but here it's not that bad. I normally don't feel too much about having hair down like this, but this is this is looking really good. I'm really digging it. This is a good one. What race was this one locked to? Was this a This had to be a dwarf haircut beforehand. This one's really cool. I really like this one. Ooh, nice and messy. That's a good mess. Ooh. That looks like that took a bit of work. Dang, these highlights are working really well. Listen to me gushing over all these hairs. I am so sorry if I'm annoying anyone. I am going to be quiet for a little while while we cycle through the hair because I do know we have quite a bit to get through. No, they did not. That's just cruel. I mean, representation. If you don't got it and you want to hold to that, then you have the option to. Oh, no, I can just picture it now. The flood of rate my character posts on Facebook and Reddit. I'm just imagining people abusing this hairstyle, making some really weird faces. If you're into that sort of stuff, more power to you. The point is to have fun, and I hope you do have fun.
I know they talked about making this possible due to some sort of um, snapping between the hair and the actual character model. And it's worked out pretty nicely. All of these are fitting really well. I will say though, for the longer hairstyles that start touching the character's shoulders, you can kind of see it a little bit here. It curves and hugs your shoulders a little not correctly. Kind of see it right there. I mean, at a glance, you're not going to notice. It's still going to look really good. But I would say they're, you know, 95% there. They just got to stick the landing just a little bit better with um, these longer hairstyles. I personally don't mind, but I'm just, you know, a little bit of a completionist I um, idea popping in my head for this. You know, want to go all the way, get it all the way down there, touching the shoulders. All right, it looks like we finally cycled through all the hair. Now, it may be just because I really liked the color and highlight combination that I landed on, but a lot of these hairs looked really, really good. A lot better than I remembered when I first skimmed through them. But there you have it for the hair overhaul. Now, all genders and all races can access all of the hair in the game that is available. And we can customize our color three different ways, technically. If you wanna add in a little touch of gray, go for it. Give yourself a little bit of extra in there. Entirely up to you. And now, for the sake of the mega video, we are going to do everything else. Now, I'm gonna leave the head alone as it is because we already know that all of the faces, they did get tweaked not too long ago, but it's more so um, higher resolution, um, better realistic facial representation with, you know, dimples, pores, etc. Which actually, you know what? No, let me take that back. We can cycle through a few faces at the moment because they're between the races and the genders. There's a lot. And I'm not going to touch on every single one of them, just for the sake of redundancy. Because I will say, though, including the hair, the whole head, their faces, their eyes. They did a wonderful job. Let's grab another race real quick. Tiefling appearance. Let's look at the heads. Let's 
maybe it's just me, but so far I can kind of see like a um, texture difference between the elf and the tieflings. Because you know how like humans gen genetically, I mean, we all kind of grow differently depending on the regions we live in. You know, softer skin, lighter skin, rougher skin. You know, um, maybe you're dried out all the time and so you're going to be growing a little bit differently. Or you live in a moist place, you know, something that has humidity. So you're going to be more shiny faced and softer. Um, I might be crazy, but I think I can see that difference with the faces so far. Definitely detail with all the pores. I think that's good so far for faces. Now the voices, I know for a fact, we still just have the same four and those same people are constantly making and remaking different voice signs for different things. Cause I know a good example is for the Bard. They talked about the cantrip vicious mockery. Each of these voice actors that we could choose from for our character, they made 94 variations of insults for that spell. So, if you're playing a bard and you like to use Vicious Mockery a little bit more than the average person, you're probably going to be hearing a whole lot of different voice lines. I would be very surprised if there's like more than a common amount of overlap with the same uh, lines coming back every time you cast the spell. Where to next? Hmm. What was that? Let's hope the locals are friendly. Hells, something just woke up down here. Be wary, this place is trapped. Yep, just the same four. Okay, so, um, trying to segue correctly. Let's sit back on our elf. I want to put, for the sake of displaying during this, there we go. What did we have you on earlier? 
What was your default? Was it was it one? I think it was one. It's opened. More of those wretched things. Okay, so we shall hold you for the current defaults. We have, of course, gone through everything in appearance. Except for tattoos. I think this is where I originally wanted to go into next. So good, clean, clear face. Let's look at the tattoos. Now, I know for a fact these are the same across genders and um, races. So we're just going to be holding to her while we look at these. And I think these did not change. I still don't know what these words are. I haven't bothered trying to translate them. But at the same time, the type of script that's used in this, I think it's like, that's called black letter. I can't read that. I cannot figure out what that actually says. I, I just keep staring at her eyes instead of the actual tattoo. And this is a Salune reference. My second favorite goddess. There's one on the neck. Oh, let's look at that. I do not remember this one. <laughs> Gives me meaning to the phrase, my eyes are up here. I just don't. Huh. That's mildly interesting. Uh, tw oh, here we go, 12. Okay. I could be wrong, but I think a few of these are actually new. Tattoo. Okay. Looks like that's it for the tattoos. Um, just real quick, let's let's touch the colors. Now let's make a there it is. I think this is the only one. This thing this is the only one that I actually once considered um using unironically. Like I've never truly been a fan of the facial tattoos. But this one, I can I can see myself using it. Okay, we are going to play with colors real quick. So intensity, of course, that slider still does what it's meant to do. All colors, we don't have too much to pick from. So blue, that, that's... Hmm, they should fix these little thumbnail colors because that doesn't look like blue. Okay, green. Blue, black. Well, that's super black. Gray, sand, white. That is very like I don't want to say neon white, but like that's bright. Yeah, that's 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 oddly bright. That's a good thick white. Ooh, okay, I'm digging that red. I have a thing for red, in case y'all didn't know. That's a decent green. A dark purple. Okay, jungle green. Okay, we got dark purple. That's a good purple. And then another black. We have two blacks. We have two blacks. Okay, that might be a bug. We have earth and top. Okay. Neato. All right, let us put this back down to zero real quick. And now we have the old makeup tab. It's going to function the same way as tattoos, just a different part of the body. Let's go down to zero. This is our base face. All right, so one, we got a slight shade. Two, we get a little more. Three, we got a nice basic wingtip. A little bit of outlining, some actual shadow that is thicker. Under eye, we have been a little fuller with a wingtip. I'm, I'm a little iffy on this one. Eight, 
Okay, these dots kind of bother me a little bit, but if that's your thing, go for it. Okay, good little smoky, some drip. I think these are new. I might be wrong, but I think these are new. I saw a few new ones in here. It's like, what would I even call these? These aren't wingtips, they're like scorpion tails? Stingers? Ooh. That's good and thick. Just real quick, let's... I'm gonna throw makeup number 12 on a Loth Drow real quick. I have a feeling that's gonna be amazingly terrifying. Okay, so let's get your hair up real quick. Yeah, let's leave it right here real quick. Number 12, we are here. Wait a minute, is that? Here we go, I had to switch back and forth. Okay. I have a feeling in an actual dark setting that might come over as more terrifying. Um, our actual eye color now, I know this hasn't changed, but I'm going to fiddle with this real quick, just for the sake of fiddling with this. Let me see. Where did you go? Demonic red. Now, see, that works. So, drow or no drow, if you combine makeup number 12 with demonic red, this works wonderfully. If you're trying to role play as an actual demon or something similar and similarly scary looking, this would be the way to go. And of course, there are a few other selections that'll match with it pretty well. But uh, for now, that was an unintended segue. So let me go back to where we were sitting right here. Back to appearance. Let's go back down. We're doing makeup on 12, number 13. This is a good one. I actually like this one. And then 14, this seems pretty minimalistic. 15, a thinner um, scorpion tail. I should look up the actual name for this. Forgive me, everyone who's watching. I am a man who does not know what he's talking about. That's interesting. There's another one right on the inside. And then back to no makeup. Okay. So I'll leave the default back to one as to how we had it earlier. Actually, no, hold on real quick. Let me get something. There we go. That's a bit more full. Let's actually look at the colors real quick. Yeah, these are working wonderfully. I know these are definitely working better primarily because of the actual face um, resolution. So because the face got better, I'm going to say the colors got better because, you know, it's an overlay. Hmm, that's a really good red. I'm just gonna take a minute to just cycle through these just to give you a quick glimpse at everything. All right, and there we go. That is all of our makeup. And I am glad that I landed on this as the last one because that works out pretty good, actually. And of course, um, let's end the appearance officially with the basics. We all will have the freedom, and I'm not gonna cycle through these because of how much there is, but we have the freedom to choose any skin color in here. Regardless of your race and your gender, we have a lot of choices, a lot of customization. So roll however you want with your character and have as much fun as you can with your character.
as you can do literally anything with it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And also just retouching our color real quick. All my colors. We have a good bit. There's a lot in here too. Um, I would say the customization for this is non-existent, but honestly, the options that are available, they don't, they don't leave me wanting. I, I don't really crave additional customization in this department. I think we did pretty good here. I don't think it really needs any more extra on it. So for now, that is it for all of the appearances. So let us go back and actually do the rest of the character creation. So in general, we will always be able to have our name to be whatever we want it to be. The backgrounds I know for a fact has not changed. We have Alkalite, it'll give us insight and religion proficiencies. Charleston will give us deception and sleight of hand. Criminal, deception and stealth. Entertainer acrobatics and performance, folk hero, animal handling and survival, guild artisan, insight and persuasion, noble, history and persuasion, outlander, athletics and survival, sage, arcana and history, soldier, athletics, intimidation, urchin, sleight of hand and stealth, and back to alkalite, charlatan, etc. So it has already been confirmed that these really are just for flavor. It ties into the whole D&D 5e replacement of the alignment system. The alignment system in the current edition doesn't truly exist in the same way that it used to. We have things like, you know, background, motivations, bonds, etc. And this is one of them. So although the actual description is primarily flavor, the bonuses they give you, those actually matter. So when you're going through your characters, please, please, please take a good look at which one gives you which and think if you may or may not want to use it throughout the game. Because it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to leave it on Insight and Religion because I personally think those two are important. But that's just me. Now, for the actual origins... A little reminder, these will be available on full release. And I think there's a mod out there that'll currently unlock these. But if I remember correctly, that one was a little more unstable compared to other mods. But I would say just be patient. When it gets here, it'll be here. So going over the races, we have all of the races we had earlier and gnomes have been added as a part of patch eight. And so just real quick, we're going to breeze through each class, each, I'm sorry, each race and each sub race and what their features and traits are. Elves on the whole, they are heirs of the mystical Feywild. High elves value magic in all its forms and even those who do not study spellcraft can manipulate the weave. Elves in general will get a cantrip, although they say it's tied to high elf cantrips. For the most part, it'll give you access to all of the basic cantrips available to the game. These are ones that have been in the game for quite a bit, so I'm not going to go over these since this, is, this isn't a spell driven video. But let me also just touch on why this thing is highlighted. So, quote, you already know this spell. The spell is a different version of the one you already know. You will have access to both. So in general, when you get new spells and cantrips, that is a gift from your race or your class, and you somehow have two versions of the exact same thing, what does that mean? The tooltip may or may not claim that it is a different or a better version, but the bottom line is, when you have your actual memorized spells, your original spell will be a part of that just like anything else. As soon as you use up all of your spell slots, you won't be able to use that one spell because all of your slots are used up. However, the duplicate of that spell, in this instance, it'll be Minor Illusion, 
you know, a different version of the spell. This will have its own slot with its own memory so that in general for spells, not for cantrips because cantrips are unlimited for spells in this instance, when you have two versions, that secondary version will always have its own slot that will be reserved specifically for it. This way it'll always be ready to use no matter what you do. Okay, long-winded explanation aside, elves, their actual full racial features are keen senses. You are proficient in perception. They will gain plus two to dexterity and their proficiencies as a whole are long sword, short sword, long bow, short bow, and then they will have dark vision, lets you see in the dark up to 12 meters, and then vice versa, superior dark vision, we will see a little bit later on different people, that is just double the distance. And as an elf, they have fey ancestry. They have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put you to sleep. So, for those of you who have actually played a little bit in the game already, if you're a little bit annoyed by certain mobs spamming the sleep spell on you, because I know a few of them actually do do that, having your main character being an elf or some type of elf that has fey ancestry, and that might just be the one tactical advantage that you might care about if, if the sleep spamming annoys you. I'm not saying you have to go for it, but it is something to think about if you're trying to be tactical about how you play the game. So for the actual sub race, high elf are specifically given. They're all going to have different racial speeds. So in general, we don't have to really worry about this. As a high elf, they will also gain plus one to intelligence. And the next for the wood elf, they keep all the same racial features, but their sub race, it's called fleet of foot, but it's just their racial movement speed. They have mask of the wild. You were raised to blend into your natural surroundings you gain proficiency in stealth and then also plus one to wisdom. And then the next sub race. So the actual elves only have two sub races. Tieflings bound to Nessus, the deepest layer of the hells. These tieflings inherit the ability to wield fire and darkness from the archdevil as Modius's infernal bloodline. Now, without getting too much into it, outsiders in general who are the ones that create these descendants, these types of tieflings and other um, mixed bloodline children. There's a lot of them out there for actual 5e and homebrewing and such. There is a lot of customization available, but for the sake of this game, we have three choices. Now, tieflings as a whole for the race, they will only have hellish resistance. Your blood protects from flame, abyssal or otherwise gain resistance to fire damage, taking only half damage from it. And then basic dark vision. Now, the sub race straight for Asmodeus Tieflings will, will only be getting plus one to intelligence and plus two to charisma. And they will also be getting a cantrip for Thaumaturgy, which just gives you advantage on intimidation and performance checks. Next up is the Mephistopheles Tiefling. Descended from the Archdevil Mephistopheles, these tieflings are gifted with particular affinity for arcane magic. This subrace in general will also have plus one to intelligence and plus two to charisma, but the cantrip they are given is the Mage Hand. And I think we all know very well how this spell works. And thirdly, we have the Zariel tiefling. Tieflings from Zariel's bloodline are empowered with martial strength and can channel searing flame to punish their enemies. Now, without going into a whole tangent about it, I'm going to just quickly insert that because this is now an option, I know Wizards of the Coast always eventually dictates canon and they haven't done it quite yet for what is sent into Avernus. I'm going to hypothesize that even though Elteral returned to the surface, since we have Zariel Tieflings available, it might be possible that her fate during the actual cannon fight is that she survived and is still a devil fighting against all of the demons in the blood war. So it's possible that nothing truly happened and the heroes just left after saving El Terrell. But that's thoughts for a different day. 
the sub race traits for the Zarl Tieflings are plus one to strength and plus two to charisma. And they also get the Thaumaturgy Cantrip. And of course, for my favorite race, the Drow. Um, so, Loth Sworn Drow. Raised by Loth's cult in the city of Menzo Baranzan, these Drow extol the virtues of their corrupt and merciless goddess. Loth marks their followers with bright red eyes, so the Underdark will learn to fear Drow on sight. The Drow racial features are keen senses, they are proficient in perception, plus two to dexterity, plus one to charisma. They have Fate Ancestry, we talked about that earlier, Superior Dark Vision, it's just double the distance of regular dark vision and their general racial proficiencies are rapier, short sword, and hand crossbow. One thing that I would advise looking into, if you have any interest in the pantheon and deities of Faerun, how Loth's and the Drow's origins came to be, because it's really interesting and it kind of ties into the next sub race as to why they exist. Seldarine Drow. And just context, the Seldarine is the kind of group name of the Elven Pantheon. And there's Seldarine and the Dark Seldarine, which are the few gods who are over residing over the Drow with Loth at the height of them. Drow are the result of an ancient schism between the elven deities Coralend, Larethian, and Loth. The latter's treachery drove the Drow into the Underdark, where they splintered into warring factions. Seldarine Drow can be found seeking allies from all over Faerun, aiming to settle their conflict with Loth and each other by any means necessary. Now, the Seldarine, they don't really have any subrace features. It's kind of just the same for both of them. And I will say though, um, by default, it's kind of not showing here. Oh, here we go. If we can use the guy. By default, the Loth Sworn Drow will naturally have red eyes because that's something that Loth specifically makes all of her children have so that they're learned to be feared on sight in the Underdark. Which, yeah, I, I, I said that earlier. And the Seldarine Drow, in a way, I wouldn't say they're purified, but the goddess Elistre, which we'll kind of touch on a little bit later for the cleric, she is the other Drow goddess that decided, and she was the innocent one during those origins. She decided to go with the banished Dark Seldarine anyways, just so that she can help the people of the Drow find their way to the light if they should choose a different path in life. Which I think it's a really noble thing for a deity to actually do. I, I, I think it's a bit different from what a lot of the others tend to do inside the pantheon of Faerun. Okay. Um, I might be paranoid right now, but I do know that dancing lights used to be a thing for Drow. Um, it's possible that happens at level two now. I might be remembering wrong. I do not know, but we shall move on. Humans, the most common face to see in Faerun. Humans are known for their tenacity, creativity, and endless capacity for growth. In general, their racial features pretty much just give them plus one to everything. Gith Yankee. Gith Yankee are peerless warriors from the astral plane, which is outer space. Known for their legendary silver blades and red dragon mounts, they seek the total destruction of mind flayers whose ancient empire enslaved the Gith Yankee for millennia. Their racial features are plus one to intelligence, plus two to strength, and all of their proficiencies for light armor, medium armor, short sword, long sword, and great sword. Hopefully we get to see more of their um, history as the game unfolds, since they seem to be tied with what's happening with the Mind Flayers and the whole main plot of the game. There's a lot to unpack there in general, and I did make a video about Blacketh and all of her stuff in the past. 
And I will just say here, I really do hope she makes an appearance in some form or another. Because lore-wise, she and what she's doing, she needs some updating. She needs some uh, some limelight love because I really think that her lore and what she's doing is actually important. And I think more people should know about it. You know, it's, it's a pretty cool thing that deserves a little bit. I'm rambling. Okay. Dwarves. Gold dwarves. Gold dwarves are known for their confidence and keen intuition. The culture of their deep kingdom values family ritual and fine craftsmanship. Overall, the dwarves have racial features for dwarven resilience. You have advantage on saving throws against poison, and you have resistance to poison damage. They also gain plus one to constitution, have basic dark vision, and their general proficiencies are for the battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and war hammer. All, of course, the bread and butter of the dwarven race. Now, the sub race traits for the actual gold dwarf, they have dwarven toughness, your maximum hit points increased by one and increased by one every time you gain a level. Now, the sorcerer has a similar um, trait, which I gonna, I'm going to say for both of these. I think it's underpowered um, compared to some of the other stuff that's out there. I mean, at least buff it to two so that it becomes something substantial. But having just one by one by one, I mean... Uh, by the end of early access, we're only getting five extra measly hit points. I mean, it's not second edition where health is, you know, a scarce commodity. So I would say, you know, beef it up by, by at least one more hit point. The racial speed and then plus one to wisdom. Now for shield doors. They survived a long fall from grace, surrendering many of their ancient kingdoms in wars with goblins and orcs. These losses have led to a cynical mindset, yet shield dwarves will endure anything to restore their ancestral homelands. Now, I might be going crazy here, but this sounds really, really close to Tolkien's dwarves. I'm just thinking about the Hobbit and everything they had to go through, recapturing Moria and all that stuff. Which is nothing wrong with that. I have a personal love for dwarves. I always regretted not, you know, maining one, but I have my appreciation. I love them for who they are. Their racial features are all still the same, and the sub race traits for the shield dwarf are plus two to strength, and then light armor and medium armor proficiency. And it looks like between these two, that is it. So we can move on to the half elves. Now these are relatively same, the same as their elf counterparts. So I'm gonna try to breeze over this a little bit more quickly. A touch of the Feywild remains in half elves with this bloodline. And even those untrained in magic possesses a hint of wild power. High elves, half elves can of course still gain a cantrip because they are considered half of the elf, they are still naturally half of the human. They can choose to place two extra stats anywhere they anywhere they want. Excuse me. They have plus two to charisma because they're supposed to be naturally uh, charismatic people for the sake of being half breeds. They want people to like them. They want to be social. That's just kind of how they naturally have been for many editions within D&D. They have basic dark vision and, of course, fate ancestry. But for them, their actual subrace traits are only limited to their actual racial speed. The wood half elves are relatively the same, except for the fact that their movement speed is a little bit higher because of the fleet of foot. But they also get Mask of the Wild they gain proficiency in stealth. Drow have elves. And here, the only true difference is also dancing lights. This is what I was trying to get at earlier. Um, it's possible that there may, may have been a bug, why it wasn't displaying, but drow in general, they are supposed to be given dancing lights as a natural cantrip for them to use. 
there's a whole lore aspect to the racials, but for the sake of the game, Drow have this cantrip. Halflings. Lightfoot halflings are stealthy but social, traveling all over Faerun to make names for themselves. The halfling race as a whole has a feature called Lucky. When you roll a 1 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can re-roll the dice and must use the new roll. They have Brave. The world can be intimidating, but you stand strong. You have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. And then plus 2 to Dexterity. Now, for the Lightfoot Halfling, the actual sub-race, they will have Naturally Stealthy. Your nimble nature makes you skill that concealment. You have proficiency in stealth checks. Of course, their racial speed, and then plus one to charisma. The Strongheart Halfling. Legends say Dwarven Blood gave Stronghearts their hardiness. Resistant to poisons and wellsprings of endurance, these halflings easily hold their own. Their sub-traits are Strongheart Resilience, advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage from their Dwarven Bloodline, their speed, and then plus one to Constitution. And these are the two options for Halflings. And finally, lastly, we have our new race for Patch 8, the Gnome. And I do apologize, the video has gone to an hour at this point. I am doing my best to hurry along. Starting off the subrace for the gnome, we have the forest gnome, even smaller than their cousins and twice as reclusive. Forest gnomes are a rare sight in Faerun. They master magic and craftsmanship in their distant idyllic groves. For gnomes, their overall racial features are plus one to intelligence and gnome cunning. You have advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. That seems pretty good, actually. Considering everything that goes on in this game, charisma aside for, you know, RP purposes, intelligence and wisdom advantage saving throws, that's really good because we get to use those two more often than you think, especially for the tadpole, because that one, that's a wisdom saving throw that we get to go through a lot. So gnomes might be a bit stronger than they appear for certain things and i'm gonna i'm gonna push it on this trait for that for that reasoning okay forest gnomes their actual sub traits are just plus one to dexterity and basic dark vision they are also given speak with animals because who doesn't like speaking with animals one of the best uh, spells in the game that almost has no use Kind of hurts me to say that, but within the confines of early access, outside of talking with Scrap, um, Scrap, uh, um, the dog, who has <laughs> been a bit, um, I really wish we could see more use with it because um, even just trying to, you know, push the limits, there's a lot of animals that just don't really do anything when you talk to them. So hopefully that'll get updated later. All right, deep gnomes, more guarded than their surface cousins. Deep gnomes survive in the Underdark with dark vision and skillful stealth. For them, their sub race traits are just plus one to dexterity, superior dark vision, and stone camouflage. You have advantage on stealth checks. And then the rock gnomes. Rock gnomes are the most common to see on Faerun's surface. Named as such for their hardiness and affinity for metal. Their subtraits are plus one to constitution, basic dark vision, and artificer's lore. Add twice your proficiency bonus to history checks. And if I remember correctly, um, it was talked about that the D&D um, expertise that is finally being added to a small degree between bards and rogues, if I remember correctly. And this artificial lore basically behaves the exact same way. All right, now we can move on to the classes. So for the sake of display, I'm going to stay on my elf. 
Now, without going too, too deep, um, I'm very quickly going to start with the cleric just so that we can breeze through the available deities and show you a little bit of uniqueness. Now, I am going to try my best to not go on segues and tangents based on lore from the actual deities in question. Um, but before I do that, I am going to show you something kind of interesting and kind of unique that I think is really, really neat that Larian did in regards to DD selection for clerics. Now, if you're actually choosing a Githyanki and you want to be a cleric, you have the option, not requirement, you have the option to pray to Vlacketh. Quick context, Vlacketh is, of course, as we see here, the Lich Queen is the sole respect leader of the Githyanki. She encourages their worship and unquestioning devotion, essentially acting as a deity. Without going into a tangent, as I promised, um, the current Queen Vlacketh is a very powerful Lich with delusions of grandeur wanting to ascend to godhood. Now, due to the whole process of ascending to godhood and how an over god Ao is involved and how the limitations of the astral sea versus being planet bound. That's a tricky thing to do. It's a good thing to dig into for information purposes, but I'm going to leave it at that. The next, the next interesting thing I wanted to point out is that for drow, the Loth sworn drow, you, <laughs> the face is still different, for Loth sworn drow, as a cleric, you are locked to only having Loth as your deity. It's a little sad knowing about, you know, their lore and their history. I think it's a little sad. But at the same time, I think this is something little, little, you know, it's cute. I like it. This is this is really neat. <clears throat> The much reviled matriarch of the drow pantheon, Loth holds sway over spiders, the underdark, and the wicked creatures of the demon web pits. Her primary goal is to corrupt all drow, transforming them into heartless cultists. If I remember correctly, the demon web pits is actually a portion of the abyss where Loth has made her home. And it's a pretty, pretty horrible place. Okay, sitting back on my pretty elf, going back to classes. All right, we're gonna breeze through the deities and then touch the rest of the class and then cover skills and abilities and then we should be good to go. All right, so starting from here, we have Timora. Timora is the bright-faced goddess of fortune who favors those who gamble and set out on adventure with the utmost skill and daring. Maliki is the goddess of forests and the creatures that live within them. She is a remote and spiritual deity, often spoken of in but the quietest of forests. Elistre. And I know for a fact I am never probably going to be able to pronounce her name correctly. I think it looks pretty for a name. I just I don't think I'll be able to ever be able to say it correctly. <clears throat> Elistre is the goddess of good aligned drow, beauty, song, and freedom. The dark maiden desires balance between all races and struggles against her mother, Loth's corrupt aims. Lathander. The Morning Lord is the god of the dawn and spring, of birth and beginnings. He is invoked to chair <clears throat> to christen both the new ventures and new life. His followers embrace growth and renewal and despise the undead. Talos. He represents the uncaring and destructive force of nature. His followers see life as a set of random effects in a sea of chaos and take what they can for who they can say for who can say when Talos will strike next. 
Selune. The Lady of Silver presides over the moon, stars, and navigation. Her power over the heavens is constantly challenged by her sister Shar, who seeks to plunge the world into eternal shadow. Now, just again, for those of you who actually like lore and especially have interest in the deities and haven't looked it up yet, Selune and Shar are two goddesses that actually have a really long wiki and have a very interesting origin story. Um, it's considered, um, what's the word, a heretical origins, um, but pretty much at one point, the two were the same being. And then they split for some reasons I'm not going to go into. And then a fight happened. And then by accident, that fight created a third goddess who happens to be Maestra. And it just it's a whole thing. I highly recommend looking into it. It's actually a pretty good read compared to the other gods and goddesses out there. But I shall move on. Shar, as the greater deity of darkness, Shar is feared for her power over the night secrets and loss. She is locked in eternal conflict with her twin sister Selune, goddess of the moon. Tempest, give us victory. Uh, I really miss Bronwyn from Baldur's Gate 1. I really wish she, she made it along into the other games, but sadly she didn't. Tempest is the Lord of Battles, overseeing war and its soldiers. He is the embodiment of honorable combat and condemns needless bloodlust. Tyr, the blind god rules over law and justice, encouraging valiant acts from his followers and relentlessly pursuing oath breakers. Bane, now this is the dead three. They are considered for the moment the main antagonists of the whole game. There's a whole lot, but my mic by accident. There is a whole lot of story that goes into them as well. It's fairly long, like I mentioned how Shar and Selena's was. And as a small reminder for anyone who may have not played the old games, Bane, Merkel, and Ball, the Dead Three, Ball is basically the whole reason the original games existed to begin with. And Throne of Ball is such a masterpiece in my mind. I have replayed it way too many times. Okay, tangent over. Bane is a dark paragon of hate, fear, and tyranny. He ascended to godhood alongside Ball and Merkel, but loathes them both for taking power he believes is rightfully his. Okay, quick context. Um, in general, the three of them used to be adventurers. They sought godhood. They um, played a game and made a bet with the previous god of death, Nergal. Jer I always remember his name wrong. I think it's Jergal. He'll come up here in a minute. You'll see. They made a bet with them over a game of knuckle bones. And in order of the way they won, they were given um, power and ascended to godhood and the original god, his portfolio over death was split into these three people. So Bane gained hate, fear, and tyranny. And you'll see here in a second, Merkel gained death. And then Baal, of course, as we know, gained the portfolio for murder. And just for the sake of keeping them together, I'm going to skip over and then come back. Merkel, a member of the Dead Three with Ball and Bane, Merkel is a cruel necromancer turned god, inspiring the fear of death in mortals. He often clashes with Kelimvor, the even-handed judge of fallen souls. More quick context, during the Time of Troubles, these three gods actually did die. And due to the lack of a god of death, Kelimvor had risen to power in that place to fill that role, but with Merkel back, the two kind of butt heads a little bit, but they both serve um, the same purpose in different ways. Where are you? There we go. Baal, the third of the dead three. He is the notorious god of murder. 
reborn after each of his descendants were viciously slain. He has a tenuous alliance with Merkel and Bane, the three having attained divinity in a bargain with the fallen god Jurgal. There we go. His name is Jurgal with a J. Um, some more quick context because I do believe it is actually really important. Ball, as we all know, is the whole reason for the Ball Spawn Crisis, our main character through the original games, the books that we will not talk about, and then the campaign setting, Murder in Baldur's Gate. Now, contextually, I will say, um, because a lot of people surprisingly do not know, and I do take the chance to tell people whenever I can, so I'll say it here. Um, the character, Abdel Adrian, we know him from the books, technically, although the books are not canon. Inside of the game, the events there are canon. What is that the coast has chosen to make him alone as the character to be the canonical main character and made him choose mortality at the end of the last game. Now, with that in mind, the ball spawn crisis was over. He still retained a tiny bit of essence inside of him because, you know, he needed to live and the gods on Olympus, you know, during the end of the game when he decides to become mortal. That whole different process from what um, Emma Wynn had gone through. So her essence is gone. So he gets to live a whole lot longer than the average human. He becomes high up in the Flaming Fist and he gets killed in the Murder in Baldur's Gate campaign setting by the long lost ball spawn sibling. Now, in that setting, when you're adventuring and that supplement is primarily just to give you info about the city, the actual little tiny story itself is basically just between Abdel and the new guy. They fight each other no matter who wins. That winner turns into the Slayer and then you and your party will kill that Slayer. Basically, both of those two people will die. It is in that moment that Ball is alive again. Now, canonically, the world doesn't know he's back. So hopefully we will see a good bit of update in the full game in regards to Ball's return, because although he is back, he supposedly can only subtly influence people. He doesn't actually have power because it is sealed on Mount Celestia. Okay, tangent over. I made a promise and I broke it. Let's go back to the matter at hand. Helm, the Watcher, is an eternal century among the gods, representing guardians across the plains. After more than a century of fading worship, Helm's power was restored with the Second Sundering. More long wiki history I do recommend looking into. Ilmatter, the crying god. He protects the oppressed and persecuted. His clergy is sworn to alleviate suffering, even if that means taking on that pain personally. Maestra, my personal favorite goddess of the whole pantheon, and I blame Ed, Ed Greenwood for this reason. Him and Elminster, that, mm, that's my jam. Okay, as the mother of all magic, Maestra oversees the weave and spreads arcane knowledge to mortal spellcasters. Her clerics preserve ancient lore and protect bastions of magical energy. Ogma. They are the god of inspiration and invention, sharing knowledge with the world through his bards and clerics. Unlike many other deities, Ogma accepts all moral alignments into his clergy. If I do remember correctly, in the original game, inside of the city of Baldur's Gate, there's actually a pretty big temple to Ogma. There's a whole lot of Da Vinci looking inventions and stuff on the inside. It's pretty neat. Kelimvor, talked about him a minute ago. Fair but distant, Kelimvor guides the dead to their appropriate plane in the afterlife. His clergy provides last rites across Faerun, but also destroys undead that have escaped Kelimvor's judgment. Moradin. The Allhammer is a dwarven god worshipped by smiths, artisans, and miners alike. He and Ladugur are constantly at odds. Definitely one of the good dwarven gods. I know there's, I think, one or two nasty ones. 
Corallan Larathian. Creator of the elves, Corallan Larathian oversees the elven pantheon as a whole, providing blessings to those who study art, magic, and nature. Also, another very deep wiki dive I recommend. Garl Glirgold, the watchful protector, is the king of gnomish gods, a deity of humor, gem cutting, protection, and trickery. Yondala. As the mother of the halfling pantheon, Yondala is known for her kindness and open mind, encouraging her followers to protect the home, hearth, and nature. Loth, we talked about that. Timora, Maliki, yep. Okay, we are done with the list of deities. <clears throat> Now, although I definitely wish the deities as a whole would give us something substantial, this is just flavor. Now, just for the sake of getting that out of the way, we can go through the rest of the classes and try to wrap up this video. Now, clerics in general, this is a long list of stuff. You have subclasses to choose from. We have life domain, light domain, trickery domain, the life domain is an aspect of many good deities offering spells and spells that protect and restore the mind, body, and soul. In general, our cantrips are always pretty much going to be the same just because of the way the class works, just to show they're not going to change. Life domain. Your actual prepared spells, again, are going to be the same because of the class. They're not truly going to change. As you level up throughout your cleric's class levels. You will see differences based on your actual subclass. The class itself will have four spells unlocked at level one. They will have proficiency saving throws with wisdom and charisma, and then proficiency with light armor, medium armor, shield, and simple weapons. And then in general, these are showing off the spells selected from up here, including a few that are just given to you. As I mentioned before, between what's highlighted, um, it'll tell you if you have duplicates. And in this instance, it'll be basically as it says, as it says here, it will always be prepared. So it will not be affected by your actual spell slots. So say you have three spell slots and you used all three of them on your regular cure wounds. You know, you can't do anything else. This extra cure wounds will still be there and be usable. And just to show you, um, there is also a little bit of minor stuff added to the subclass features. So we need to go over that real quick before I go away. The life domain, they are given heavy armor proficiency, discipline of life. Your devotion empowers your healing spells. When casting a healing spell, the target regains additional hit points equal to two plus the spell's level. And then of course there are domain spells which you will see more as you level up. Light Domain. The Light Domain is offered by deities of Justice, Majesty, and Primordial Flame, providing spells that dispel darkness and harm the undead. Their sub-features are Warding Flare. Shield yourself with Divine Light. Use your reaction to impose disadvantage on an attacker, potentially causing their attacks to miss. And of course, the relative Domain spells. Now through here, we can actually see the difference. It'll actually give us Burning Hands and Fairy Fire. I will say personally, if Burning Hands actually does do a good bit of damage. Like you would expect it to do slightly more because of what you think it is, but it, it's pretty deceptive. 3d6 does a good chunk of damage if you give it the chance. And then of course, Fairy Fire, I think is very underrated. I think everyone should use it because having advantage on attack rolls is muy bueno. And of course, this domain is given the cantrip for light. You can attach this to any object and it'll illuminate the whole room. And trickery domain, a domain shared by wicked and chaotic and mischievous deities alike. Those who channel trickery specialize in deception and illusion magic. And also it's worth noting that although you get nice and different little icons, um, based on the domain and what it says, each god is kind of tied to it. You still have the option to choose anything from this list.
The only true difference with this one is, of course, the domain spell is given to us, which will be Charm Person, Disguise Self, and then Blessings of the Trickster, which is just advantage on stealth checks. All right, let's touch the new class next. Now I am going to try to make another video that is specifically devoted to the Bard so we can level through it and actually see what we can get with it. Bard, you know music is more than a fancy, it is power. Through study and adventure, you have mastered song, speech, and the magic within. Although you do have access to some of the original cantrips, the brand new one that is unique to this class is Vicious Mockery. This is the cantrip that I mentioned earlier. You actually have like 94 different verbal variations when you cast this spell. Unleash a string of enchanted insults at a creature. It takes damage and receives disadvantage on its next attack roll. And of course it does 1d4 psychic damage. The spells given to us, most of these are the same that we've already seen. I would say the two that are new is definitely, I don't recognize them, so I'm going to claim they're new. Heroism, bluster yourself, and an or an ally with valor and health. The target can no longer be frightened and gains five temp hit points each turn. Dissonant Whispers. I think this one was already here before. I truly don't remember. Whisper a discordant melody to a creature. It takes three six second damage and becomes frightened. On a successful save, the creature only takes half damage. Okay, I think this one is somewhere in the Warlock tree that is unique to that, I think. And then Tasha has been there. Okay, so that is it for spells. Now, one neat thing is bards have a starting instrument. Pick the instrument you'd like to use. It will influence the soundscape when you cast spells and can be... and can be changed later by equipping a different instrument. We will, of course, have the option for a hand drum, a flute, that is a big flute, a lute, that's a big lute too, unless she just comparatively is small. We have a lyre and a violin. Well, that seems to size, that seems an accurate size. Now, the actual features for the class, we of course have spells level one. We will have dexterity and charisma saving throw, and then proficiencies in light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbow, long swords, rapiers, short swords, and a musical instrument proficiency. I'm gonna assume this will only be relevant for bards whenever they're attempting to actually play. Whereas if anyone else attempts it, they're either gonna not be able to do it at all, until we initiate as a bard and they can join in or if they do attempt they're just gonna have a higher chance of failing because so far this looks like it might just be flavor so we'll see more as the game progresses and of course as the bard we'll have the basic action for bardic inspiration inspire an ally with your performance they can add a 1d6 bonus to their next attack roll ability check or saving throw Now for the basic barbarian. The strong embrace the wild that hides inside, keen instincts, primal physicality, and most of all, an unbridled, unquenchable rage. Now this one is actually added in the previous patch with number seven, if I remember correctly. Now the features for this class are, we have proficiencies for saving throws in strength, constitution, and then light armor, medium armor, shield, simple, and martial weapons. In general, they are given the rage class action. While raging, you deal two extra damage with melee and improvised weapons, and when throwing objects. You also have resistances to physical damage and advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Rage ends early if you haven't attacked a creature or taken damage since your last turn. Ah, yes, the bread and butter of the entire Barbarian class. And one little bit of extra to go with this. Barbarians have unarmored defense. Your body is as resilient as any armor. 
while not wearing armor, you add your constitution modifier to your armor class. Wearing heavy armor impedes your rage. So it's something to think about. If you up your dexterity and your con, your AC will probably surprise you. The good old ranger. My original go-to when this game came out, or when early access started. Rangers are unrivaled scouts and trackers, honing a deep connection with nature in order to hunt their favorite prey. Now it's good to point out that they actually will start getting more druidic spells as they level up. As a whole, they can choose a favorite enemy. Studying the tactics and abilities of certain creatures has granted you a set of abilities that is useful in a variety of situations. You can be a bounty hunter and gain proficiency in investigation. Creatures you hit with ensnaring strike, either ranged or melee, have disadvantage on their saving throws. Keeper of the Veil. You specialize in hunting creatures from other planes of existence. You gain proficiency in Arcana and can cast protection from evil and good, which grants protection against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. Mage Breaker. You have a history of battling spellcasters. Gain proficiency in Arcana and the True Strike Cantrip, which gives you advantage on attack rolls against a creature. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for this spell. The Ranger Knight. You have sworn to serve a crown or a nation and seek to bring its foes to ruin. Gain skill proficiency in history and armor proficiency with heavy armor. If I had to guess, Minsk as a character within this game, he would definitely, because we know he's a ranger, he would definitely fit as a ranger knight. And then Sanctified Stalker. You swore to hunt the enemies of a holy or druidic order. Gain proficiency in religion and the sacred flame cantrip, which deals 1d8 radiant damage. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for the cantrip. Say what you will about clerics. I do think the actual Sacred Flame cantrip is pretty reliable. And if you can hit those eights, that's, I think, a lot better than some of the other cantrips. Natural Explorer. Years of traveling in the wild have made you particularly attuned to the beasts or adept at surviving in certain environments. Here you have the choice to be a beast tamer You've cultivated a strong bond of animals you can cast Find Familiar as a ritual. Urban Tracker, an expert at navigating the wild within the city, you, you gain slight of hand proficiency. Or Wasteland Wanderer, Cold, Fire, and Poison. And of course, for these three elements, you gain resistance to that element and take only half damage from it. And as we switch these, we can see there is a slight difference beneath us. So for now, we are going to stay on Beast Tamer, where we can see this little kitty icon with Fine Familiar. This, of course, is an already established spell that we know about. And as a whole, for the rate, for the class, we have Proficiency, Saving Throws 4, Strength and Dexterity, and then Light Armor, Medium Armor, Shield, Simple Weapon, and Martial Weapon. Basic fighters have mastered the art of combat, wielding weapons with unmatched skill, wearing armor like a second skin. They will be able to choose different fighting styles. Adopt a particular style of fighting as your speciality. You can choose archery and gain plus two to ranged weapons, defense and gain plus one to your armor class while you're wearing armor. Become a duelist. While you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and nothing in the other, you will gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon, increasing your chance to do heavy damage. And then great weapon fighting. When you roll a one or two on a damage dice for an attack with a two handed melee weapon, then that die is rerolled once. Protection fighting style. Now I think this one is new ish. Either I don't recognize it, or they changed it up just a little bit based on these little icons. When you have a shield, impose disadvantage on an enemy who attacks one of your allies 
when you are within 1.5 meters. You must be able to see the enemy. This is a reaction. Toggle a reaction during your turn and it will automatically execute when needed. And finally, two weapon fighting. When you make an offhand attack, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. And now lastly, for the actual features, we will of course have proficiency saving throws with strength and constitution, and then light armor, medium armor, heavy armor, shield, simple weapon, and martial weapon proficiencies. And I will say the minor bread and butter of the fighter class is having the second wind. Just based on playing Lazelle in the past, I will say this ability is really, really helpful to have. So always remember to use it when you get a little too low. Now for the Druid, we are roughly halfway, a little over halfway. Druids channel the elemental forces of nature and share a deep kinship with animals. Mastery of wild shape allows them to transform into beasts from all over the realms. Now, I know I've already explored the beasts that are available, um, but I do really hope they give us more options as time goes on. They're going to have access to a few of the old cantrips, but they will have three that are unique to them. And actually, I think this one in particular can also go to the mages. Produce flame. A flickering flame appears in your hand and it sheds a bright light that can be thrown. You can either kind of do this in melee range or just straight up throw it. You're basically, you're just throwing fire for 1d8 fire damage. But you are all also able to use this for a light source. Shilele. Imbue your staff or club with nature's power. It becomes magical and deals 1d8 plus 2 bludgeoning damage. And you use your spellcasting ability for attack rules. Now, this is actually a very, very reliable spell. I constantly, constantly, constantly am using it whenever I am playing a druid. I highly recommend you do not sleep on this cantrip. And third of the unique ones, Thorn Whip. Now this one is a bit comical because even if you're not doing it for damage, just yanking people off their feet, it's kind of funny to keep doing that to people. Especially if they are a little too close to one of your party members, you whack them with this and you can gain some distance between your party member and said opponent. Strike at a creature with a thorny vine-like whip. It deals 1d6 piercing damage and pulls the creature 3 meters closer to you if it is large or smaller in size. Now for the actual prepared spells, we get a lot of the same with some, I would say, emphasis on Entangle. I currently don't remember if it is available to other classes. But the iconic one that is going to be unique here is the Good Berry. I highly recommend if you do choose to use these, make them before combat, after your long rest, whatever. Get them made and hand them out like candy because these actually come in handy. The actual class features will give us spell castings at level one, and then the saving throw proficiencies at wisdom, intelligence, and then we have proficiency with light armor, medium armor, shields, clubs, daggers, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, and spears. And that is all we have for druids. Good old warlocks. Bound by a pact to an all powerful patron, Warlocks trade their loyalty for supernatural abilities and unique magic. First option is the Fiend. Warlocks in service to fiends work towards corrupting destructive ends, intentionally or otherwise, and receive hellish blessings in return. 
Now, a few of these we already know about, but the one that we all care about is Eldritch Blast. Conjure a beam of crackling energy that deals 1d10 force damage. Now, Sacred Flame aside, I will say arguably this is the best damage cantrip in the game, especially since later on you can take a feat that will turn your Eldritch Blast into a knockback. So you literally just only have to spam this one cantrip during fights. Now, for the most part, your actual spells, some of these may seem a little unique, but they are actually available to the other magical classes. And finally, the class features for the Warlock, they get their spells, and then they will have saving throw proficiencies with Wisdom and Charisma, and then Light Armor and Simple Weapons. For the Fiend, they will have the Dark One's Blessing. When you reduce a hostile creature to zero hit points, this gift from your patron grants you two plus one temporary hit points. Now, in the middle of a fight, if you're constantly getting the last hit on a lot of people, this actually works out pretty good. It doesn't stack but it's good to constantly have the ability to just bring it right back up. The Great Old One. Warlocks bound to eldritch beings in the Far Realms work towards inscrutable goals, gaining strange powers over entropy and the mind. Now with this one, it's a bit of a minor difference. The cantrips are the same, spells roughly the same. We see the differences for this one just a little later. I almost want to say the primary differences for this one are going to happen at a full release past level five. But for the moment, the great old one does not have anything extra. And now my current favorite class the sorcerer sorcerers are natural spellcasters drawing on inherent magics from a gift or bloodlines to start things off if you remember our girl nira from the enhanced edition add-ons this is her class you can be a wild mage your powers come from the ancient forces of chaos they churn within you waiting to burst free at any time now, for the most part, you pretty much act as a basic mage between your cantrips and such. However, as a sorcerer, and I almost want to say it's unique at this point. I need to double check that when we get to the actual wizard. Chromatic Orb was a new spell added recently. And whenever you click on these, you click it once, it'll give you the option on the bar which element you want to use. But that aside, the class itself will get constitution and charisma saving throws and then have proficiency in daggers, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows. The subclass feature for wild magic, that is the important part. You will gain access to wild magic itself. Wild magic stems from the forces of chaos. It churns within the sorcerer that wields it, waiting to burst free. So basically, whenever you cast any spell, there is always a chance for it to go crazy. It'll do double damage. It'll change the way it looks. It'll do something entirely different. It'll do something that's not even doable with other spells and other classes in the game. There are a few unique outcomes that I've seen. And then they will also have Tides of Chaos. This is a toggle ability that I only recommend using on desperate moments or just big finishes during fights. Activate to gain advantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. It increases the chances of wild magic surging afterwards. So although it'll help you a bit on your next move, it does have a little bit of a drawback, which in the long run could be a good thing. And now for my favorite part, the Draconic Bloodline. And I just think this is one of the coolest things they've added so far. 
Your veins carry draconic magic, the result of a powerful dragon ancestor. And full context, um, once upon a time, silver, not silver, metallic dragons actually do like to transform and mingle with humans. And of course, after a while, some of them do choose to mate with said humans. Um, to a degree, it is also possible for chromatic dragons, but I do not personally know how they do that since, to my knowledge, they can't transform. I might be wrong there, though. Anyways, their cantrips are still the same as we've been seeing. Their spells are the same as we've been seeing. However, here is the unique portion for it. As a dragon sorcerer, you get to choose your dragon ancestor. With your dragon ancestry, you are choosing, although it's changeable later, you are choosing your facial scales and color, and you are choosing extra benefits you can have later on at level five when the game fully releases. We have dragon ancestry for red fire. I'm gonna read this tooltip once. Fire is the damage type associated with your dragon ancestor. At level six, excuse me, it is level six, spells that deal fire damage are more powerful and you can become resistant to fire damage. Now with this in mind, there is of course, fire with the red dragon, black dragon as acid, blue dragon as lightning, white dragon as cold, green dragon as poison, golden dragon as fire, silver dragon as cold, bronze dragon as lightning, copper dragon as acid, and the brass dragon as fire. As you're making your way through these options, they have default cosmetics based on your actual ancestry. It's supposed to show your lineage to your choice. But fret not, you are not stuck with it. You will have the option down here to change what your scale patterns are and what color you want to go with. You do have a, a little bit of a good choice here, good sizable three rows. So I do recommend taking a little bit of time to figure this out. And if you do want to, just for the sake of the freedom of having it, if you have the dragon sorcerer selected in the appearance tab, there will be an extra slot for your bloodline. So as you're messing with your hair and your face and everything else, you will still have the option right here to change your bloodline. But coming back to here real quick, one thing to note also is between your actual bloodline, you are gonna be given a spell that is different based on your bloodline. So red dragons will be getting burning hands, black dragons will have grease, Blue dragons will have Witch Bolt. White dragons will have Armor of Agathis. Green dragons will have Ray of Sickness, which is surprisingly a pretty good spell. Gold dragons will have Disguise Self. Silver dragons will have Feather Fall. Bronze dragons will have Fog Cloud. Copper dragons will have Tasha's Hideous Laughter. And Brass dragons will have Sleep. Now, it may just be because I'm reading a book in Faerun that is tied around the dragons and all of the, um, the issues around the rage. And I'm sure there's a lot of it inside the actual wikis if you dig into it. Each of these dragon ancestors, there is lore reasons behind the spells we are being given. Like just for a quick example, where is it? Copper, they're, they're naturally tricksters. They like to make friends and tell jokes and just be, you know, goofy, funny, etc. And that spell <laughs> being Tasha Sidious laughter, it, it kind of ties into that. And the same thing with gold being able to disguise themselves because, you know, they like to mingle among humans a little more than the rest. If I remember that correctly. And as the whole coming back down here for the dragon sorcerers, the actual subclass features will be draconic resilience. 
hit points similar to the dwarf. Your max HP is increased by one for each sorcerer level. And then Draconic Resilience. Dragon-like scales cover parts of your skin, as we can see. When you aren't wearing armor, your base armor class is 13. So something to think about based on availability with your armors. You may or may not want to actually take advantage of this. And now for the rogue, we are almost at the finish line. With stealth, skill, and uncanny reflexes, a rogue's versatility lets them get the upper hand in almost any situation. Their class features are saving throw proficiencies with dexterity, intelligence, and then proficiencies with light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords. As we already know, the rogues will be able to start off with sneak attack, both melee and ranged. The weapons in general will give you advantage against them. And finally, the good old wizard. Wizards master the arcane by specializing in individual schools of magic, combining ancient spells with modern research. Now here is where originally all the cantrips were available. As we can see, they're all still here. Nothing is truly unique here. They have all their spells available to them. They have a little bit more available in general. Yeah, here we go. Chromatic Arbor is correct. It's available to you too. And of course, as you level up based on your new school of magic chosen, you will kind of have branching choices, but to a degree, everything will be available to you. And thankfully, they give you the option to choose your prepared spells like the others. And the class feature, of course, you have your spells level one. You have intelligence and wisdom saving third proficiencies and then your basic proficiencies with daggers, quarterstaffs and light crossbows. As a part of the whole class, you will also gain the action for arcane recovery. Once per day out of combat, you can replenish expended spell slots. I personally always forget to use this one on Gale, but it, if you have a habit of going for long fights without um, going back to camp to do long rests, it, it helps to push things just a little bit. All right, I am a very tired speaker. But like I said, the finish line, we are here. And just for the sake of visuals, I'm going to put you back on Warlock because I really do be digging their outfit. Skills. Now, as a whole, based on your race, your sub race, your class and your subclass, there will always be something to denote where it's coming from. You will have your skills. This will affect things in the game as you approach them. You will be rolling against these whenever the need arises. You have inherited the skills of religion, insight, and perception based on our background as alkalite, and then granted to us being the race of elf. However, we still have choices. Based on what is remaining, we can choose between arcane and deception, history, intimidation, investigation, nature, and we're given religion from background. Now, this is always going to change based on your choices. So instead of choosing from here first, just think about what you want when you're picking the race, because when you get to this point, you're just picking the extra stuff. So it's like, OK, I got what I wanted already. What else could possibly help us that I don't truly care about? I think that's the best way to look at it. So I would say, for example, with this setup, I like religion, insight and perception. I think they work out well for the way early access has gone. On. Something else that would be smart to have is Arcana and I think history. You could also replace Arcana with investigation or nature. Those have some pretty good uses so far. And then, of course, down here, it tells you everything you are lacking. 
And like I said, depending on your class and race, these will change and move around. And the part that only we actually care about when the time is right, our actual ability scores. Now, this, this is technically called a, if I remember correctly, a point by system. The higher you get, the more it costs to put an actual point. It's not going to be like the old games where you can just roll endlessly and hope you, you know, get a 90 range and then get a bunch of nice, really good stats instead of rolling low in like the 60 range, something like that. Um, Larian, if I remember correctly, said they're never going to do that. I hope they change their mind. I hope they give us options. But for the most part, this is what we have. Strength is your muscle and physical power. This will affect your athletic skill and your effectiveness with melee weapons. It also determines how far you can jump and how much you can carry. Dexterity is agility, reflexes, and balance. This affects your three dexterity skills and your effectiveness with ranged and some melee weapons. That also affects your initiative and armor class. Constitution is just stamina and physical endurance. This affects your hit points. And then we have intelligence, memory and mental power. This affects your five intelligence skills and improves spellcasting for wizards. Wisdom is senses and intuition. This affects your five wisdom skills and improves spellcasting for clerics, druids, and rangers. And finally, we have charisma. The one stat that a lot of people care about in other games because talking is fun. Charisma is the force of personality. It affects your four charisma skills, influences traders' prices, and improves spellcasting for bards, sorcerers, and warlocks. Whew. That was a lot to talk about. But before I wrap things up, let me just specify. If you click on the drop downs for each of these, except for Constitution, obviously, it'll actually tell you each skill that is related to each one, and it tells you which ones you have proficiency in. So it's always good to take a look at this, because if you're choosing to just sink a stat into nothingness, it's going to have to remind you that if you're rolling for one of these skills, you're going to be negatively affected by that. But depending on what skill you have maxed out as your main, you can have extra. So it's always good, I think, to balance these out to a neutral 10 and then just put the overflow wherever you want. So personal discussion, I would say since, as an example, we have Sorcerer. So of course, we dump everything into our main stat. Um, 15, give that room to turn to 16 later, potentially. And then we have dexterity to affect initiative and armor class. Don't knock this stat if you don't think you need it because initiative on its own is really important because if you're constantly at the bottom of the totem pole, just waiting for your turn, that's going to inhibit you more than you think. And of course, who does want more armor class? Armor class will keep you alive. Now, thankfully, we do not have to be loot hoarders anymore with the way our camp works. So you really, if you're not playing a warrior who needs strength, you really don't need to touch this. And then con, that's your overall HP. I recommend that as the third dump stat because after armor class, if they do hit you, you're going to want to have a little bit of extra squishiness. And then, of course, we have wisdom and intelligence. As I said before, make sure you max out whatever your primary stat for your class is, and that will always be demo denoted by this star. But of course, if you're lazy and you don't truly care about it, whatever class you choose, if you click recommended, it will give you something decent based on what you will be needing.
And that is it, everyone. We are right at the two hour mark. Please forgive me for how long this took. I am glad we got it done. I am glad we got through this together. For those of you who actually stuck through or at least skimmed through so that you could see all the parts that you wanted to see, thank you for sticking with me. This was a good bit of effort and I am happy you are here with me. Hopefully I covered everything you guys wanted to see. Um, this was for all intents and purposes meant to be an updated mega video on everything that the character creation process currently has to offer as of patch eight, which was released just a few days ago. Now, work and life allowing, I promise I will be trying to get a Bard video as well as a few other things rolling within the next couple of days. So until then, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Until next time, everyone, I hope you stay safe out there and have fun with the new class and the new race. Until next time, stay safe out there.